dedicated to the strength of the nation. Proudly, we hail. Yes, proudly we hail, starring Edmund O'Brien in Take a Letter, Miss Devlin, the United States Army and United States Air Force presentation. And now here is our producer, the well-known Hollywood showman, C.P. McGregor. Thank you, thank you, and greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your theater of stars, where the finest talent of the motion picture world join us for your entertainment in plays we know you'll enjoy. Our star is that popular and capable actor, Edmund O'Brien, and the title of our comedy romance, Take a Letter, Miss Devlin. In our story, Eddie becomes an assistant to a department store tycoon and has business secrets that make him a target for the opposition's strategy to learn the plans. When an atom-powered blonde goes after him for the secrets, Eddie calls on his secret weapon, his secretary. We'll have the curtain for Act One of Take a Letter, Miss Devlin, immediately after this important message from your announcer. Only the best can be aviation cadets. And if you can qualify and are selected, you'll receive the finest pilot training in the world with the United States Air Force. To qualify, you must be between the ages of 20 and 26 and one half. You may be either married or single. You must have two or more years of college or be able to pass an equivalent examination. After one year of thorough training, you will win your silver wings and receive a reserve commission in the United States Air Force. Apply tomorrow at your nearest Air Force base or U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force recruiting station. Remember, only the best can be aviation cadets. Now, once again, our producer. The curtain rises on Act One of Take a Letter, Miss Devlin, starring Edmund O'Brien as Joseph Cooper III. Weaver's department store stood directly across the street from King's department store, which made their rivalry through the years rather intimate. But, as a matter of record, Weaver's had been there first. And, as a matter of fact, W.L. Weaver, venerable owner of the store, which bore his name, would never forgive his arch-business rival, Clarence King, for having built directly across the street from him. All of which is well known to the mild-mannered, the speckled young man who approaches W.L. Weaver's office at this moment. For he's Joseph Cooper III, Princeton class of 38, Weaver's general manager. From his looks, he had never dreamed that he had once been intercollegiate boxing champion. You uh, sent to me, Mr. Weaver? I most certainly did. Sit down, Joe. Thank you. Say, what the devil have you got in your buttonhole? Oh, that's, uh, that's one of my prized camellias. Care for it? No, I don't care for it. Well, I'm concentrating on camellias these days. Quite proud of the way mine are doing. Well, if you'd think a little less about those camellias and a little more about this store, I'd be a lot happier. You don't understand, Mr. Weaver. When I get production on these, I plan to put one in the buttonhole of every floor walker. Well, not a bad idea. Of course, that bandit across the street, King, will immediately copy us. But you've got something there. I always keep this store uppermost in my uh, cogitation. Just see that you continue to do that. But now I have news for you. Oh, really? News of the utmost importance and the utmost secrecy. Well, I better shut this window. Oh, yes. Of course, we are on the 10th floor, but one never knows what sparrows may be delivering information to King. How true. That character, that fawn in my side, that weasel masquerading as a man. Oh, no, not now, Mr. Weaver. We must remember to temper anger with, with compassion. I, I just can't help it. For years, he's tricked me. I know. First, he had to build across the street from me. Yes. Knows I always pick the best spots so that he could spy on my operation and steal my customers. I know, I know, and you have my sympathy, Mr. Weaver, believe me. Then he starts undercutting. Yes. Now, I sell men's long underwear for the dollar fifty. He sells them for a dollar and a quarter. Unspeakable. I go to a dollar fifteen. He goes to a dollar ten. Horrible. Finally, in order to get rid of my underwear, I have to give it away. Flap and all. He's quite a competitor, all right. Yes, when he's wearing the brass knuckles, he is. Ah, but I've got him now. 
that's the news I have for you. We're going to break ground next month for our new Westview store. Oh, well, well, that's remarkable, Mr. Weaver. Surprise. Oh, yes, I certainly am. Yes. You didn't have any idea, did you? No, no idea whatsoever. <laughs> We've really got the jump on Mr. King this time. Oh, yes. You know, that community's really growing. They're going to town out there in Westview. But the most important factor is that we're going to be situated precisely where the two new highways will cross going through town. Why, Mr. Weaver, that's quite a location. I should say it is. <laughs> of course, it's misleading at present. Not much out there now, but in a year's time, when we'll have our new store ready for operation, <laughs> it'll be the center of town, Mr. Weaver. I congratulate you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Of course, we'll have to keep this very quiet oh, for a while. Yes. <laughs> we can't wait to see the look on King's face when he wakes up some morning to see our store going up. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Mr. King's coming in. Tell him I'm out. Hello, Weaver. I'm glad you're in. Yeah, it's you. That's right. I'm Joe. How are you, Joe? I was doing quite well a moment ago, weren't we, Mr. Weaver? Yes, we were. You don't even stop to knock on the door these days, do you, King? Oh, your door's always open to an old friend, isn't it, Weaver? <laughs> I just dropped in to confirm a bit of news I just received. A uh, bit of news? Yes, that you're going to build a branch store in Westview. Why, who, who told you? Who told you? <laughs> Thanks for confirming my little news, Weaver. Confirming it? I deny it. Oh, stop it. There's confirmation written all over that sour pussy of yours. Now, if you'll tell me where you're going to build, we could kind of go in together, build a shopping center. Get out of here. Oh, won't tell, huh? All right, I'll find out. Uh, good morning, Weaver. And straighten up your merchandise, won't you? It looks sloppy. Get out of my office. Now, now, you see, he knows I'm going to build. Before my own general manager knows, he knows. Well, now, actually, Mr. Weaver, too much harm hasn't been done, so long as he doesn't know... Where you plan to build? Well, say, that's right. Sure. And it's comforting. Well, uh, where are we going to build in Westview? Where? Yes. By, uh, Ninth and Bond Street. Ninth and Bond Street? Yes. Now, don't tell another soul. Oh, no. No. Mr. King will never get this priceless bit of information. <laughs> Good morning, Miss Devlin. Good morning, Mr. Cooper. Uh, Miss Devlin, are you alone? Well, yes. And why are you looking so secretive this morning? Well, I just talked to Mr. Weaver. He doesn't want Mr. King to know something, something he told me. Well, people are telling people things every day. No, you don't understand, Miss Devlin. This is dynamite if it ever gets out. Well, if Mr. Weaver told you something confidential, just keep it to yourself. Don't tell anyone. Button your lip. Button my lip? Hmm. I never thought of that, Miss Devlin. Oh, simple things always seem to escape the complex mind. Yes. And don't you think I've been your secretary long enough to be called Ruth? Yes, Ruth. <laughs> Forgive me, it just seems so uh, informal. Well, no wonder. It's only been four years. Mm, seems only yesterday, the first day you stepped into my office. Oh, you do make me feel better always. Um, take a letter, Miss Devlin. Ruth. Uh, Ruth. Uh, Miss Ruth Devlin, City. Uh, would you care to accompany me to the Camellia show this coming Sunday at the auditorium? Uh, we could even have dinner afterwards. Well, how nice of you. Yes, I, I thought it showed considerable uh, imagination, phrasing it to you in the form of a letter. Oh, it did. And it's the first time you've asked me out. Well? I'd love to go out with you. You would? To the Camellia show or anywhere. Oh, Miss Devlin. Ruth. Ruth, your eyes have a rather hypnotic look, which I hadn't noticed before. Who knows? Maybe patience is having its reward. Yes. <clears throat> well, I, uh, I, I think that'll be lovely, having you join me at the Camellia show. <laughs> and you won't let any thoughts of the store here spoil our afternoon. Thoughts of Mr. King. Oh, no, no. King doesn't worry me now. Not, not in the least. <laughs> Well, Mr. King, will I do? Honey, you'll do but good. <laughs> I'm glad you approve. Now you understand what you're supposed to do. I think so, but let's check. 
I'm to go to the Camellia show. That's right. You look for a fellow with horn-rimmed glasses. That's Cooper, the general manager of Weaver's store across the street. You can't miss him. He looks like a football player wearing a Camellia. Oh, I won't miss him. And now, all you want is the sight of the new store in Westview, right? That's all, honey, but that's enough. Now, remember, I don't think Cooper has ever been out with a woman in his life, so take it easy. Oh, I'll handle him as if he were a rare piece of crystal. And, uh, if I'm successful... Five hundred bucks. Good luck. <laughs> Judging of the professional class, hothouse from camellias will commence at the south end of the building in five minutes. Oh, Joseph. Yes? You don't mind if I call you Joseph, do you? Now that you call me Ruth, and I'm here walking along beside you with my arm on yours? Well, uh, no. Thank you, Joseph. Oh, stop looking at those camellias a minute and look at me. Uh, what? No, go on and look at your camellias. Let's just walk and look. It's heavenly this way, too. I don't, um, I don't quite follow you. Oh, you will sometimes. I'm very patient. Oh, you are? Oh, well, then you'd be very good with camellias. Oh, I would be. Oh, yes. Think of it, though. This is our first afternoon together. Couldn't be more delightful <laughs> here with the flowers. Oh, it simply couldn't. I know that today history is being created. And tonight? Tonight? You promised to take me to dinner, remember? Oh, oh, of course. <laughs> I couldn't forget that now, could I? Uh, pardon me. Aren't you Mr. Cooper? Why, uh... Oh, why, yes. I thought I recognized you. Oh, uh, perhaps at the uh, Weaver store in town? Uh, I'm the store manager. Oh, no, no, no. Nothing so mundane as that. Oh, no, no, no. This is a new approach. Oh, uh, what was that? Oh, don't mind me. Continue. Oh, no, Mr. Cooper. I've seen so many of your glorious camellias in the flower shows the past year or two. Well... <laughs> Really? Yes, I, I thought your entry in the state show last year should have taken the prize. Why, why, thank you. Had I been judging the class, you would have won the prize hands down. Well, then you're a camellia fancier yourself. Oh, I should say. I simply dote on that. Oh, you do? Well, yes. forgive me, I, I haven't asked your name. Teresa Lee. Uh, a Miss Teresa Lee. Natch, Natch. Uh, what was that? Nothing. I'm Miss Devlin. How do you do? Flower lover. Yes. Also well acquainted with the various forms of poison ivy. How nice. Well, now we've all met. Isn't it just dandy, though? Yeah, I think it's fascinating. Uh, well, Mr. Cooper, I don't want to keep you. Only a moment. Oh, you don't have to rush off. I'm, uh, I'm with Petal, the horticultural magazine. Well, isn't that, isn't that splendid? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. But my publishers have been very anxious for me to do a yarn on you. On me? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a surprise. Oh, now you're just being modest. And so charming along with it. Mm, she spreads it on with a trowel. Oh, I beg your pardon. Ruth. The woman demonstrating the peace moss over there. Oh, how fascinating. But, Mr. Cooper, could I have an interview with you? Why, I, I'd be very honored. When? Well, uh, uh, sometime next week. Well, I have a deadline to meet. You know how that is. What time would be convenient with you? Well, how about uh, tonight? Well, yes. Oh, oh uh, you wouldn't mind, would you, Ruth? Oh, no. I wouldn't mind, not at all. Of course, we could all go to dinner together. Well, that's what I meant. Oh, but then, Mr. Cooper, we wouldn't have an opportunity to talk. Talk? Oh. Well... Oh, uh... I'll drop out. Put me in a cab, Joe. Goodbye, Miss Lee. Uh, really, Ruth, I hate to do this, but... Oh, I, I insist. There isn't anyone who has a chance to be written up in petal. No, that's true. Besides, there'll be other days... There will be, won't there, Joe? Oh, sure. Tomorrow, uh, the next day. Uh... And besides, I'm such a patient fool. To pause briefly from our story, take a letter, Miss Devlin, starring Edmund O'Brien, to bring you an important message from your government. Ladies and gentlemen, our Army and our Air Force are critically short of physicians and dentists. Over 2,000 volunteers from these two professions are urgently needed today to safeguard and care for the health of the men and women who, as members of the United States Army and United States Air Force, are serving you and me at home and overseas. Young physicians and dentists, particularly those who did not serve in the armed services during World War II, have been asked by their government to act now to volunteer for duty at once. 
If you are one of these young physicians or dentists, please write or wire either the Surgeon General of the United States Army or the Air Surgeon of the United States Air Force at once and volunteer your services. If you know of one of these young physicians or dentists, please call his attention to this urgent message. Thank you. curtain rises on act two of Take a Letter, Miss Devlin, starring Edmund O'Brien as Joseph Cooper III. Mr. Cooper, chamelea fancier, erstwhile ex-boxing champion at Princeton and general manager of Weaver's department store, is in possession of a bit of priceless information. This consists primarily of the fact that Weaver's new store in Westview will be built at 9th and Bond Streets, destined to be the center of this fast-growing community. In order to gain this information, Clarence King, owner of the opposition store, has put a blonde, Teresa Lee, on the trail of bashful young Mr. Cooper. Miss Lee, it seems, has quite captivated our Camellia fancier, so much that his lovely secretary, Ruth, is almost at wit's end. As our scene opens, W.L. Weaver, owner of the store, steps into Cooper's office. Where's Joe, Miss Devlin? He's out, Mr. Weaver. Out? He's up in men's clothing buying a new suit. But he just bought a new suit last week. He's getting them by the day now. Why? The blonde. Uh Uh-oh. So it's a woman. Not a woman, a blonde. Now, now, Miss Devlin, you seem rather upset. I am. You uh, are naturally loyal to Joe. More than that, I'm in love with the fool. Mr. Weaver, I don't know what to do. There, there, there now. Sit down. All he does is talk about her and buy new suits. When did she come into his life? At the Camellia show. And you know what? There's something phony about her. Sure, sure. No, there is. She's supposed to be with Petal, the horticultural magazine. The other day I called over there trying to reach Joe. They'd never heard of her. Well, if she's posing as someone else, maybe she is up to something. I'll instruct Mike of our police force here at the store to check up on her. See who her friends are and so forth. Oh, thank you, Mr. Weaver. If I hear anything, I'll let you know. Now, don't you give up the battle. Oh, I won't. And thanks. Well, Ruth, how do you like my new suit? You really want to know? Why, by all means. It's atrocious. Oh, you're joking. Any self-respecting awning maker would turn down that fabric. Why, I thought it was quite sharp. Matter of fact, as she did, too. Who? Teresa. She picked it out. Say no more. I guess we all don't coincide in our tastes. I guess we don't. I'll be uh, leaving a little early tonight. Again? Why, Ruth? Must I gain your permission before leaving the store? I'm sorry. I have a rather early engagement. With her? If you are referring to Teresa, yes. Ask her when your write-up is going to appear. Tell her I called the magazine over there to order the first copy off the press. Good evening, Teresa. Oh, Joe, come in. Thank you. Oh, oh, you dear, dear boy. Hmm? You look tired tonight. I do? Yes. Come over here and sit in this chair. Let me rub your forehead. Uh, All right. Oh, you are tired, aren't you? I I really wasn't. Uh, That is, not until you mentioned it. Now I'm, I'm really tired. Oh, you poor boy. You've just been working so hard, haven't you? Oh, well, uh, not really. I think you should have more help in your office. Hmm? Or perhaps that girl you have. Uh, Shouldn't she be replaced? Oh, no, not Ruth. She's a wonder. Oh, Joe, dear, you're so tired. Yes, I'm dead. Oh, poor boy. By the way, um, um, when will my story come out? A a story? Uh, Yes. Ruth, my secretary, was wondering. She told me to tell you that she called the magazine to order... She uh, called the magazine? Uh-huh. Well, that, uh, that was very considerate of her. Oh, you poor boy. Yeah, <sighs> does that feel better? No, it's worse. Oh. I think I'd better go home and go to bed. I know you've been so busy. I understand you're planning a new store in Westview. Mm-hmm. Who, who told you that? My dear, uh, a brother who lives out there. Oh. Yes, a camellia fancier, too. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Mm. Why, in his more affluent days, 
He used to import camellias from Hong Kong. Hong Kong? Yes, but now with a wife and a family of ten children. Ten children? Yes. Yes, soon to be eleven. Well, now he can't afford the luxury of a plant. Well, I, I shall send him some blossoms. Oh, Joe, how kind of you. You know, he often felt, my brother, that if he just knew which way the town was going to move there in Westview, with the few dollars he has to invest, he could make out. And, of course, your new store will certainly point the way. Well, listen, I wouldn't say this to anyone except a man with, with ten children, but oh. you tell your brother there will quite possibly be considerable activity in the vicinity of Ninth and Bond Streets. Oh, uh, did you say Ninth and Bond Streets? Mm-hmm, that's right. Oh, you are a dear, Joe. Oh, oh, I... I suddenly have the most horribly splitting headache, Joe. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you, you will forgive me if I trundle you on home. Oh, oh certainly, certainly. Oh, <laughs> you, you've talked me into the desire for some rest myself. Oh, <laughs> yes, well, good night, good Joe. Night, dear. Good night, dear boy. Get rest, won't you? Oh, yes. Oh, and say, uh, don't mention that address in Westview to, to anyone, will you? My dear, perish the thought. Hello? Mr. Weaver, Ruth. Oh, yes, Mr. Weaver. Joe in yet? No, but I imagine he was out late last night. The blonde? Unfortunately, yes. Incidentally, I have some information for you. We've checked up on her. Nothing against her character, except she's a friend of Clarence King. Oh? And what could be worse than that? Anyway, keep your chin up. Thanks, Mr. Weaver. Good morning, Ruth. Well, good afternoon. Oh, it is rather late, isn't it? Anyone call? No one in particular. Here's your mail. Thank you. Did you ask Miss Lee about your story? I did. What did she say? She was noncommittal. Oh. I understand Miss Lee is a very good friend of Clarence King's. Oh, that's so. Huh? What? What did you say? I said I'm surprised you haven't bumped into Clarence King over at Miss Lee's. Who, who told you that? I have it on very good authority. Why? Well, because if she's a friend of Clarence King's, I'm afraid I've been double-crossed. What do you mean, Joe? You look scared. Oh, I am scared. I, I gave her the address of our new store in Westview. Oh, no. Start now. Uh, uh, let me talk to Teresa Lee, please. Miss Lee checked out. Uh, checked out? She left a half hour ago for Havana. Oh, thank you. I've been taken in, but good. Good morning, children. It's Mr. King. So it is. Just stopped in for a minute on my way up to Weaver's office to tell him about some building I'm going to do in Westview. I'm just bursting so with joy, sunshine, and good cheer this morning, I had to pass a little of it along. Then, then the world is all right with you, Mr. King? Oh, my boy, if you only knew how all right it is. Well, I'll be bustling along. Just a minute, Mr. King. I haven't done anything like this for a long time, but I'm afraid I'm impelled to add to your morning. What was that for? As if you didn't know. I'll sue you. You can sue me, but don't get off that floor. Or I'll deposit you right back on it. All right, Joe. Joe, you, you're a fool. I'm a fool. Well, come on. I've got to tell Mr. Weaver. So you see, Mr. Weaver, King has your address in Westview. <laughs> That's great. Huh? Great. As a matter of fact, I think you deserve a bonus for this. Uh, I do? Why, sure. After all the trouble I've had with King knowing my every move, I deliberately gave you a wrong address. Then you're, you're not going to build the store at, at Ninth and Bond? No, I'll build a parking lot there, and if King gets any customers, I'll charge them $2 a head just to park their cars. <laughs> Take a letter, Miss Devlin. Ruth. Oh, Ruth. <laughs> uh, dear Miss Devlin, I have been both a fool and an idiot. Please know that I realize that, and I, I only wish that... Uh, May I continue this letter for you? By all means. Come here. I'm going to kiss you. Oh. Shall I continue? By all means. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you just can't end the paragraph there. 
The curtain falls in the final act of Take a Letter, Miss Devlin. Our star, Edmund O'Brien, will return for a curtain call after this timely message from Wendell Niles. This is important. This is urgent. Over 2,000 young physicians and dentists are needed as volunteers at once for service in the United States Army or United States Air Force. These physicians and dentists are required to safeguard the health of the men and women who are serving our country in the armed services. If you are a physician or a dentist, you are needed now. Write or wire the Surgeon General of the United States Army or the Air Surgeon of the United States Air Force at once, volunteering for active duty. Let me repeat that. Write or wire the Surgeon General of the United States Army or the Air Surgeon of the United States Air Force today, or see your local U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force recruiting station. And now back at the microphone, our star, Edmund O'Brien. Eddie, for your debut here, I don't know whether I should welcome you as a film personality and star as Hollywood's proudest father. He's the proudest dad in Hollywood, see. And how is little Bridget Eileen O'Brien and her lovely mother, Olga St. Juan? Well, they're both wonderful. And CP, my wife and I both want to thank you for that beautiful little silver cup. Not at all. You know, Eddie, if I may, I'd like to go back a few years to your work in summer theater. I hear you were a very dynamic Othello. <laughs> I don't know about dynamic, but that was in Roxbury with the Columbia Lavatory players. Our Othello got Tomain, so I got my big chance. And after the play, I ran over to the voice coach's house two blocks away. She was ill with Tomain, too. I told her about the ovation I got. She said, I heard it, and I heard you, too. You may not be the best, Othello, but you're the loudest. <laughs> that was a subtle bit of sandbagging. Yes, but I managed to stay in Shakespeare. That and the experience you had with Orson Welles, Laurence Olivier, and as Prince Hal in Henry IV was the best in the world. You know, C.P., after the first night of Prince Hal, I got my name in lights. And the next night, I blew my lines and gave the worst performance in my life. Couldn't stand the lights. Those are the bumps in show business. But uh, you have done all right. Well, I got a contract with RKO after the Prince Hal thing. I was doing all right, and then I moved to Universal. I went in the Army, and afterwards I came back to Universal and finished my contract. I recall some of your pictures there, the Killers, the Web, Double Life, and then... Uh... Yes, and then I went over to Warner Brothers, and I'm very happy. Things look pretty good, too. I should say they did get off to a good start at Warner Brothers with Fighter Squadron. That was a fine picture. Now, uh, what is your latest one? Well, it's called Backfire. It's a bang-up adventure drama. Lots of shooting. Has a great cast. I hope you catch it if you like action. I think I you like sure it. I sure will. Well, fair enough. Now, what will we be looking forward to in your theater next, C.P.? Next week, Eddie, and ladies and gentlemen, we bring you a story of a little British war orphan who comes to the United States to live with her aunt. When the child loses her only prop, her aunt searches for a method of understanding and finds it when she can see the world through the child's eyes. Beautiful Gale Storm is our star, and the title of our story, Where the Heart Is. That should be great. We'll be listening. So long, C.P. Goodbye, Eddie. <laughs> be sure to join us next week, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll bring you Gale Storm in a dramatic story, Where the Heart Is. Until then, thanks for listening, and cheerio from Hollywood. Edmund O'Brien appeared for the courtesy of the Hollywood Coordinating Committee, which arranges for the appearance of all stars in this program. The script was by Rich Hall, with music by Eddie Dunstan. The program was transcribed in Hollywood for release at this time. Wendell Niles speaking. <laughs>